this year moderating with a uh, very famous guest this time. Uh, maybe you also could just say some words mm -hmm. and then we could have a very uh, humble, cozy debate on the LGBT issue, but also how can cinematography and movies uh, have an impact on the acceptance of this community. We had uh, films that we have shown and uh, never had a reaction from people, like bad reaction or something. People are taking it well, so that's why we decided to, to start with debates also, but relating it with the cinema always. I have to uh, point out that when we started it from the beginning, our main partner was American Embassy, and until now, we always had support from American Embassy to do this program. We are very thankful for that. Uh, we do it with Outfest. The program is curated by Outfest programmers. And uh, then we get the selection, we select a number of films, and uh, usually, you know, they have, they have success always, you know, because people come and, and watch them. In order to start the debate, just before that, I'm, I'm really honored that Ambassador Greg Delloy is here with us, and I really would like him to say a few words because he's a great friend of the festival and great friend of, of this program and uh, encourages us to, in doing these activities. Please, Ambassador. Uh, thank you very much. It's great to be here and great to join uh, all of you uh, to discuss our GDP issues in Kosovo uh, and to be part of the Christine Film Festival, which is you know, one of our favorite events uh, here. So, uh, certainly welcome to all the panelists today. Uh, thanks for being part of one of Kosovo's best cultural events. Uh, I also um, like to thank you also for orga organizing this panel discussion and Sir Gaga for uh, serving as moderator. Again, my colleague Michelle Chung was here uh, last year with you. Uh, unfortunately, at least for me, uh, I guess for everyone else too, Michelle got on the plane today and she left uh, for her uh, future assignment in the United States at the State Department in Washington. So she couldn't be here, but I'm going to do my best to substitute her in the show. So. Uh, certainly, our agency strongly supports uh, the human rights of the LGBT uh, community in Kosovo. Uh, but you know, I think we all know there's still a lot of work that has to be done uh, here um, to make sure that everyone really has the freedom uh, to be themselves without fear of persecution and has the support of the legal system. Uh, and I think we're, I, I know we're very proud of the attention uh, that it got uh, for the important issues facing the LGBT community. Um, and I, I hope we can all learn something from what our panelists have to say tonight. I will stop talking now because I <laughs> want to hear what you have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, uh, in uh, 1980s England, which of course now, the Eng England in the 1980s was a, a much like the England in fact of 2017, it was a deeply, deeply divided place going through a huge sort of cultural and social revolution, um, politically and, and socially, particularly with regard to race and sexuality. Um, and that struck me, Sasha and I, as a very fertile ground for drama. Um, and when we thought about sexuality and thought about the idea of a, a gay protagonist, placing that person in the, the deeply, deeply conservative and very violent world of football. So it's, it's exciting for me to be here and to, uh, to be able to see what's happening here. Um, and as far as uh, programming LGBT cinema goes, um, it's something that always, I've always been passionate about. That was my an, an initial intention of working for Outfest, was to uh, find some involvement with the LGBT community through the arts. Um, and that's how I personally am interested in, in working with um, LGBT, um, the community and with LGBT rights. Um, and I think that that's something that has just naturally extended into my work with Sundance. A lot of the programmers at, at Sundance have also worked at Outfest. Um, in a very practical way, it's because you can work for both festivals, <laughs> um, because they're on opposite ends of the, the festival calendar. Um, so I think that, uh, in just in terms of what we're interested in and the work that, um, that we're seeing from LGBT filmmakers and filmmakers who are interested in exploring those themes are, um, they're the ones who are pushing the envelope, and, and that's the type of film, 
filmmaking we want to support. I was never interested in making a film for the LGBT community. It's too small a community to make a film for. And also, who wants to make a film for a tiny section of the population? You want to make a film for everybody. What is the point of films that we can't all enjoy? So it was very important to me. I, was, I thought I was making a, a love story, a story of a marriage, of a partnership. Um, and, and, I, and it was important to me that it was accessible and that it was accessible and attractive to people who thought, who were perhaps had a vestige of homophobia or who were just, I mean, I think, you know, we live in a world of very accelerated change and there are people who I think are, are stigmatized as homophobic because sometimes they just can't keep up with the pace of change. They don't live in a metropolis. You know where where they're very comfortable with with the kind of terminology that w we're all used to using, and and we see this in, in race as well. And I think it's really important to try and not exclude people, to try and include as many people as we can. And so, so the Danish girl, it's it's a it's a beautiful film. I think you know it looks beautiful and uh, it's inviting, and I think it's about things that a lot of people can relate to. And I think there's no question that. An audience that we had, you know, when they do all the research, they run the numbers in advance, and the producers sit looking very nervous, saying, "Oh my God, we're doing, we're, it's going to play very badly with men, straight men, aged between 46 and 59." You know, they come back with an analysis, and and everybody gets very nervous about that. But actually, older, older, um, perhaps ostensibly more conventional uh, cinema goers did really connect with it, and they talked about. Uh, what, what was fantastic about it is that they talked about enjoying seeing people in a long relationship. They were impressed by the fact that these were people to fighting to stay together in a marriage and that they, that they felt very sympathetic to that. And what they weren't doing was talking about transitioning. They would, so they were, they were empathizing in a, in a way that wasn't about, you know, can I accept this? They, they, they simply had gone the journey with the characters. And I think that's... Um, that's a really important, uh, that, that for me is what's really important. And this is, an, I, I hope this isn't a kind of offensive analogy, but um, I don't know if, it, Milton wrote a, an amazing epic poem called Paradise Lost, and uh, it's supposedly a very Christian piece of work, but without question, the most charismatic character in it is the devil, <coughs> is, is Satan, and you feel incredible sympathy for him, and you feel grief at his fault. He's very, very fully humanized. And, and Milton makes you go that journey. He makes you sin. He makes you fall from grace with that character. Just for a moment, I just want to talk to my husband. And she breaks down, and it's very, Alicia Vikander is very moving in the role, and she, she says, please, please, let me talk to my husband. And Lily says, no. And there was, behind me, this guy went, you bitch. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, I like, and I looked around, and there was this, like, the biggest, whitest, middle-aged man I'd ever seen. I was like, Okay, and there's a bit of me thought, you know what, it's great, he hates her, but he said, you bitch, he believes she's a woman. He believes she's a woman, he didn't go, you fucker, you bastard, he said, you bitch. And I thought, I've won, I've won. So, you know, so that's, I think that's how it works. But, I mean, the beauty of the, f of the movie stands in the fact that it's not LGBT as much as it is only about the, the T, so about the transgender people. Yeah. I would like to, 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 to go back to, to Alexander and to Sasha. You've, you've chosen a, a football player, which is not really something typical. And I'm afraid, I mean, as much as we are having a lot of m movies regarding the LGBT community, I, I, I always see some movies that are very typical and very feeding the, cl the cliché. So do you think that we fear that? I mean, I, this is very atypical for having a football player, this very manly figure of a man, but also trying to deal with the sexuality. Uh, how was the, the, the movie created, and uh, do you fear that, uh, I mean, not, not just about your movie, but also for the other movies, maybe the movies are sometimes doing not better, but actually doing the whole situation worse regarding feeding the cliché, making very cliché movies regarding the LGBT community, like they accepting us and nothing more? Um. I mean, it's an interesting question. It's, it's funny because we made a film about a homosexual man in the world of football, and I, I guess you could class it as an LGBT film, but you know, I was thinking about other references for, for the film that we made, and I've written here Milk, which is about a homosexual in the world of politics, 
Philadelphia, which is about uh, homosexual in the world of corporate law. Uh, Moonlight, which is about homosexuality in the African American community. Basically, we're telling stories about outsiders, people on the outside, and that's exactly what this is. Yeah. And I think being a storyteller, we all have that kind of observational quality. I think I got it being, um, you know, my, my mum's Iranian, my dad's Indian, I went to a very strict English school. Uh, initially, I kind of felt like I was on the outside. So immediately, I had this kind of observational perspective, you know, and I, and I, I was kind of on the outside. And I've noticed that most storytellers share that quality. They kind of feel like they're on the outside for one reason or another. And that's why they have that wonderful perspective. So we just thought, here we've got this, this idea, we had this, you know, we, 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 Alex and I have been collaborating for a few years now, and we've written and developed a number of things that we haven't made, but then we came up with this, and we just thought, God, this is a story that really needs to be told, because it's an outsider that we all, and, and you know, this film is very much beginning its festival run, but somewhere, somehow, you kind of hope that someone will see it, and the point of this, which I think is it's a positive conclusion, is, You've got to hope that someone, someone somewhere, sam somehow, will have the strength to be themselves, to, to say, it's okay, I can kind of accept myself for who I am, despite the fact I'm a professional football player or a, or a lawyer or if I'm in the African-American community. So I think the, the conclusion is one of positivity, I think. And even for someone who might be ignorant, they'll still come away and they'll see this situation in a way that they previously may not have. So ultimately, I don't think there's any negative conclusion, I think, as much as you kind of try to, you know, you might have feelings about transgender people, um, you watch the Danish girl, like, you've got to be cold as ice if you don't feel something, you know, if you're for that protagonist, so I think ultimately the conclusion is certainly like a positive one. Yeah. And also placing these characters in real in a real world context. So what you say about uh, you know avoiding cliche, obviously every I think every writer and every filmmaker wants to avoid cliche. Unfortunately, it's actually quite a difficult thing to do. Yeah. Um, but by placing um, characters from from different backgrounds in a real world context that is relevant to a broad audience. And for instance, in the UK, if you're making a film about a footballer, you've pretty much got every single man, every single man, yeah. pretty much. Um, so if you want to send out a message about an issue that probably the majority of men do not think of about or are afraid of um, or in some way don't want to engage with then by putting it in a context that they can relate to that's definitely that's definitely a great step I think. When you write when you do a movie about LGBT community or maybe that's somehow related to the, to the community uh, do you fear that this might play a role on how on, on your reputation on how the people are going to like uh, watch you, I mean, because, for example, in Kosovo, we don't have a lot of people, a lot of filmmakers who do movies about it, and I believe that part of it is because they they don't want to be watched as people who can be supportive to the community. So do you think that in, in the actual cinematography world, there's a fear of people wanting to like tackle the issue of the LGBT? Um, Although I think that we have a, like the number of LGBT movies is always like growing, growing. Um, I, so, uh, initially I think you, you asked me in a personal context, no, absolutely not, I, I don't have any fear on, on that level. Um, ultimately, any story really should be judged on the merit of whether it deserves to be told. And if I think, especially living in quite a privileged position in a Western uh, democracy, if I was afraid of retribution, then I'd be nothing more than a coward. Um, but in, in a broader context, I think in other areas of the world, absolutely, there are plenty of filmmakers and storytellers who quite rightly would be frightened of telling those stories, not only for fear of being ostracized by the film community or by Financiers, but for fear of violent retribution. Um, and I think that the more that we can do in societies where we have that freedom and can distribute that message, the better, because it so better enables people in, in parts of the world where that's more challenging to do the same thing. Um, this wasn't a question that I wanted to ask, but somebody, one of my friends, said that I should do it. Uh, when you do the, the when you when you choose the actors, especially for the LGBT uh, movies, uh, is it very important that the actors themselves need to be from the community, and does this play any role in the outcome of the movie? Uh, yeah, well, yeah. I can, yeah, well, I've been through this particular <laughs> shit storm. Um, but yeah, I think my response to that would be, I think it's really important, uh, well, speaking specifically for, uh, for the Danish girl, that there were, there were transgender actors involved in that. They were not playing the leads. It, it was 
there and they were not in leading roles for reasons that are very obvious and that we all hope will change in time. But the idea that a trans only a trans actor can play a trans character is terrible because it means trans actors can't play cis characters. So I think most professional transgender actors are horrified at the idea of that. And certainly Rebecca Root, who's a transgender actor in the UK who had a smaller role in The Danish Girl, um, said to me, but people, people kept saying, why, why weren't you seen for the role of Lily Elba? And I said, but why weren't you seen for the role of Gerd, Gerda Thena? Why were you not seen for the role of the cis one? We have to all be able to, uh, you, you know, I'm a, I'm a writer, I have to be able, I'm a, a cis woman, I have to be able to write male characters, or I have to, you know, it's crazy to think um, otherwise. So uh, I think it's really important that those questions are raised and that films continue to raise those questions, and it's important to improve, uh, you know, increase the, the working possibilities for... For, 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 for people who are marginalized, uh, and, and certainly you know, the LGBT community, is not, that's not the only group that's marginalized. So generally, it's part of the same conversation. Mm -hmm. But I don't think, in terms of putting uh, artistic strictures on the, uh, around this, I, I'd be very uh, nervous about that. I did trying to get the Danish girl made. Every financier we went to said, we love the script, nobody wants to see, we're not putting any money in it. Nobody wants to see this film. Nobody wants to hear about this topic. It's, it's, it's revolting, we'll never make any money. Uh, and nobody wanted to finance it. By the time we made the film, we were in a very different landscape. We were invited to the White House uh, to, to, to kind of show the film, and uh, we were invited along with Jill Soloway and the cast and crew from a, a series called Transparent. Uh, Transparent is Jill Soloway's story of her father transitioning and becoming, went from popper to mopper. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a really wonderful uh, story. Uh, it's, it's a kind of family um, drama. But what's fantastic when you watch it, because people have talked to me about this great transgender drama that's on American TV. It's, it's, on, it's an Amazon s series, actually. And it was a huge step forward, and there were lots of trans writers on it, and all the crew, and the, you know. So it was incredibly forward looking in terms of all that. And when I watched it, I just thought, wow. It's like a sitcom about East Coast Jews. That's what I was amazed by. It's like very kind of East Coast Jewish humor. And the trans thing is also there. And, but it's family life. And it just happens that this is part of their family life, is that the person who was their popper has become their mopper. And that's just one of the many strands in the story. But Jill Soloway is, um, is I think, really important in terms of raising the profile of trans actors but there are, and, and writers and crew. Um, she just made another series called I, uh, I Love Dick, which is tremendous, tremendous series. And, uh, but I think certainly in the UK there are more and more visible uh, transgender actors. And, and actually the, the argument about Danish Girl, about Eddie Redmayne as a cis male playing that role, was really useful. It was really useful in that it forced a conversation that nobody had had before. So it was, it was great to have that in quite a high profile way and I think very useful. Uh, what was the reaction from the LGBT community? And basically, when you do when you when you do this kind of movies, yeah. is it that you you I mean the screenwriters and the producers make like a prior research or during the period of like having the movie, do you meet with the community? Do they know that you're doing the movie? Like, can they have an impact? Can they put their experience within the movie? Oh, certainly. Well, I mean, it's based on a, a true story. A true story. So, uh, and there was a huge amount of research went into trying to uncover what was a very buried piece of uh, queer history uh, in that case. Um, so, I think we worked very hard at that, um, and we and and later we had a lot of consultants and we talked to a, a, a lot of transgender people about about the extent to which it reflected their experience. It is, of course, also it's a film about one person. It's a, it's one individual story. And uh, I think there were, it's always very interesting that you had, we had all sorts of reactions from the transgender community. And some people, there were uh, trans women who were very offended by the hyper feminization of Lily Elba. Um, and I can understand that in a sense. I mean, as a cis woman, it makes me uncomfortable. Uh, but I've got to tell you, you look at every portrait of Lily Elba. Lily Elba's never seen without a fan or a feather boa. I mean, Lily was creating herself as a kind of hyper woman. Um, and that was absolutely part of her story. Mm -hmm. um, and there are lots of reasons why trans women in particular, I'll just speak to that, pre present that way quite often. The drag aesthetic is still very, very strong, you know, in, in the community. Um, there was a fantastic, 
you know, after the Second World War, when hormones became available uh, and people transitioning, so the, so the idea of a sex change started to, people started to talk about that and the possibility of having hormones uh, arose. There was an amazing questionnaire that you could fill in to where, whereby they decided if you were suitable for, for a transition. And it said things, I mean, honestly, I'm, it said things like, what is your favorite color, pink or blue? If you saw a mouse, would you kill it with a hammer or stand on a chair and scream? And so the, it was a crazy gendered uh, questionnaire. And it was incredibly obvious. If you wanted to transition, it was obvious which boxes you had to tick. So there was this huge reinforcement of, uh, of gender stereotyping that I, I think has continued you know, in the community. There are terrible, heartbreaking websites for, 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 for people who have recently transitioned where they'll say, uh, if it, you know, if you're if you're going out as a woman, um, make sure you have a bowl of pasta before you leave, because women will only eat salad, and they will leave half of it because they don't want to look greedy. <laughs> and you think, oh my God, this is so depressing, <laughs> you know. So that kind of stereotyping is is still very much part of that community. And I think some of the reactions we had from trans people were about how, you know, we are the, that community is in a state of flux, and people were, you know, there is no. There is no one trans story. There are, there are as many stories as there are people. And so, uh, yeah, some people, some of the trans community absolutely loved it. Mm -hmm. And some people were, were uncomfortable about the, the feminized aspect. Uh, we, we're gathered here to actually analyze how movies can play a better role in the society mm -hmm. accepting it. And you're talking about stereotyping. Mm -hmm. So what about the movies who really do stereotype, like the movies who have a bad impact? Is there a way of... Well, you mean all the others? <laughs> yes. A lot yeah. of movies. Yeah. I mean, well, I, you know, I'm, it's an LGBTI panel, but I, you know, I'm, I'm a cis woman, so almost, I mean, almost every film I see is, has some, is, is offensive in some way or other. That's why something like, I love Dick, is such a relief. You can think, oh my God, women, look, real women, actual women, know. you know. It's thrilling. Uh, but there's not much of that about. And I will sometimes, you know, with my <coughs> husband, I'll sit and we'll watch, a, you know, we'll start to watch a TV show and I will count the number of men, you know, before, and I'll think, oh, so we're up to seven men now and there's been no woman speaking. And uh, once I get to, we get to ten double figures, I'm like, it's a, it's, we don't watch anymore. Mm -hmm. It's because it's, it's, it's too much. I'm sick of it. I've had it, I'm too yeah. old. I think also that at, at this point, too, the, the, the role of the, the, you know, so-called gatekeepers are is essential. So, like the people who are greenlighting series, mm. the people who are, you know, making sure that the financing comes through for films, festival programmers, people who are who are there and who are filtering all the material that's being all the the product that's being made. That that role is essential, and. So I, as, a, as a festival programmer, I feel a great sense of duty to make sure that the images of LGBT, I, the, the community is, are, are interesting and challenging and are, are pushing things forward. And that's why I think, I totally agree with you, Vincent, that, that um, you know, Jill Soloway is a pioneer. Yeah. And what she's doing is, on one level, completely um, accessible and on some level mainstream that mm -hmm. that sh you know she can be able to to uh, to get a huge following to watch this this show about a, a trans <laughs> a trans father yet also I think it, her work is exciting because it's so radical in that way too like to just have all these crazy queer characters mm -hmm. on on a television show like that is is um, exhilarating I think how many movies uh, uh, are there for the for the LGBT community within Sundance? Like within one edition, do you have a lot of movies applying? It depends um, from year to year. Yeah, I would say that there are quite a few LGBT films, uh, theme films that are applying each year. I would say this year we had a very um, a very <laughs> good <laughs> um, LGBT year, and uh, we had. Well, you premiered Moonlight, didn't you? No, we oh, didn't. didn't okay, Alas, sorry. we did not. <laughs> um, uh, but there are, I think, four films in our World Dramatic competition that were LGBT film uh, themed films, and which is uh, a third of the competition. 
and there were a few in, in our U.S. dramatic competition. And interestingly, this year that we had a film called Beach Rats um, that is just sort of starting its festival, um, uh, international festival rounds. Its um, European premiere is at Locarno in a few months. And this is a film that ends with a, and I'm sorry if I give out any spoilers, but it ends with a, um, a, a, a gay bashing. And it's, it's a, a little ambiguous as to what happens, but it was interesting for me to see an audience react so um, negatively to, to seeing a gay bashing. Um, that it was just, it was not something people wanted to see, and people were really angry. And they took the, <coughs> the filmmaker to task and really challenged her as to why she felt it necessary to include this in her film. And it was based on a true story, so that's part of it. But um, the, the, the negativity around that, people just, people in the US especially, it's very hard for them to see that because they think we're so far past that point in our, in our society. So um, I mean, that was, it. and also I think the, the, the argument around art and what is art um, came into play too. I think there's a lot of um, sexism involved too, that there's, it's a, a woman who's putting this image out. So it was a very pr provocative film um, and in ways that kind of went beyond how I imagine an audience would react. So can I, can I just ask mm -hmm. you about this? So, so are you saying that the audience was upset because it didn't, it felt that, uh, it felt that the gay bashing was, uh, that, was it just they just didn't want to see it? They didn't want to see it. Yeah. Okay, it so they just, just didn't want to see it because they didn't want it to be true. Yeah. Because we know we haven't moved past it. That's what's yes. so interesting. <laughs> That's what I found very interesting. I mean, I think this is where we all have to slightly check our privilege. I felt working on uh, the Danish girl that we're talking to, certainly the trans community in LA, which is very, you know, in, in the filmmaking community. So, for example, uh, Lana Wachowski. Um, there, you know, there are people who have enormous, uh, with respect, enormous kind of privilege and um, they have an enormous amount of security uh, and who talk about transitioning in this, in a sort of fantastic, epiphanic mm -hmm. way as it being this glorious kind of flowering and who don't want to see any kind of negativity in that portrayal and of course the truth is if you are a kid you know almost anywhere other than in one of those metropolitan bubbles that is not your experience or if you are a, an adult you know that is almost certainly you're not going to meet that the kind of acceptance those people are uh, you know are, are, are lucky to uh, to have and so I think it's really important not to uh, shy away from those things. I had all these terrible kind of conversations with myself about maybe I should end the film before she dies, you know, so that she end goes out on a high. And then you think, <laughs> but it's just a fat lie, you know, it's just a lie. Because it's really important that it was those final surgery, that the final surgery that brought about her death, but it was also the surgery that completed her in her eyes, you know. And it was a, tr so it, it was a kind of triumph for her and she knew the risks involved in that surgery and she chose them and to not and I think certainly there, there, are, there were certainly elements in the community who would have preferred if we'd ended the film earlier and she'd not died but that would have been a terrible disservice to that character. It came a moment in his life when he told me now it's the time either I have to get married do something for the community, maybe not really a marriage that most of other LGBT people, LGBTI people that decide to get married do, like he didn't want to trick the girl into getting married, but he was thinking about making a, some kind of arrangement with somebody just so that he can live here, or he said I have to leave the country. And uh, my friend left the country and, um, and uh, then he did the film. About uh, and the film. I mean, I think I think it's very um, very important for us to hear these stories and to know that I mean these people are part of part of our lives. And what happens here in Kosovo is that uh, we all have uh, gay people that we know, but no nobody is open because it's not safe to be open. And I mean, people in families, they may think that this is something that happens like really uh, to somebody else, or I don't know, but 
we're, they're all, I don't know, we're, we all know people, mm -hmm. but maybe we don't know that they, that we know them. And, um, so that's a, that's a positive movie, actually. So you're well, trying to have a positive impact, right? I, I wish. <laughs> yeah, that's what, I, that's what I wish for. I mean, I would love uh, for people to see that um, what drove me to make this film, I wanted to make a love story, actually. So I would love people, if they can um, see this film as a love story uh, between two people of the same sex. They were judging, I, I, it, maybe it was only me, but I had that feeling that they were judging me because I was doing a film about, I don't know, about the LGBT community. And, I, and also there was um, another person that is part of the community who uh, kind of uh, said to me that like you're doing this for the money or something like that. And it was, <laughs> I, 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 expected, I expected everything, but I never had this in picture that I'm going to be, I mean, the LGBT community is going to attack me before even seeing the film. But then I can sort of see where that comes from in lots of ways. But it's also, uh, in other ways, it's kind of unhelpful. Um, and there was a point where I think there was one persistent critic on Danish Girl before we'd ever before we'd even started shooting somebody who was very agitated about the fact that that I you know that I wasn't trans that the director wasn't and and so on and um, and that we would somebody said on the one hand uh, people were saying uh, nobody ever heard of Lily Albert on the other hand people were, the, this critic was saying that you've taken one of our most important stories. Lily Elba is one of our great heroines and it is for us to tell that story and there is a sort of bit of you that thinks well she God bless her has been dead for 85 years so tell the freaking yeah. story you know, because you're not doing it and yeah. I understand you're not because you don't have access so why don't you let us with our you know our Titanic of a film we'll kind of break see if we can't kind of break some of this ice and you know I think it's really important that that people who do have access and do have that privilege use it to kind of break through and to kind of, you know, and with a, with a bit of luck, other things can come through in the slipstream of that. It's yeah. really important. So I understand where, where some of those concerns come from. And I think it's really unfortunate that if I were, if I were to, if I was offered The Danish Girl as a script, to, you know, as, as a project to write today, I would feel uncomfortable. I would feel... Uh, I feel awkward about it, but that film was 11 years in the making, and so when I said yes at the beginning, the, the trans issue was much less politicized. Now I would, I would expect that reaction now, absolutely, and it would make me question whether it was a good idea. If I can say something mm -hmm. about Lerta, <laughs> um, she actually told me about her project five, like around five years ago, it took you a long time. and. And and that was your concern from the very beginning that you were an outsider telling the story, but you were being very responsible about it. And I really appreciated that. And I said, you know what? If nobody else in your country is telling this story, it, tell it. <laughs> I, I think yeah. To, to to continue that that point actually, um, if you look at anybody with any power and agency in the world of film, they happen to be mostly uh, white male and American. Uh, and if those people continue, oh, that is changing, a changing picture, certainly, but that has been the, the truth historically. And if those people continue just to tell stories about people that look like them, as they have since time immemorial, then what's really going to change? And whilst part of that absolutely is about empowering people not from those backgrounds and who do not have that power and agency, part of it also has to come from within, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Mm -hmm. I guess we're slightly coming to the end, but maybe I'm going for the, this very direct question, maybe this like research question of the whole debate. What are the components of a, of a good movie about LGBT? And how can we create good movies regarding LGBT to sort of have this impact? I would say there are exactly the same components <laughs> as any other film, you know, Absolutely. try Because you can be cliche, you yeah. can feed the stereotype, you can feed the stigma. Yes. But how to make it very atypical, how to like... Well, I don't think, I, I don't know if I, I'd be particularly worried about making atypical, you want to make it true, mm -hmm. if you can. And so that, that's, that's what it's about, is finding, is, is finding something that is, uh, that is true. And 
Yeah, I, I, so I would say it's the same components as with any film, you know, try not to be irresponsibly cliched. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's easier said than done sometimes. But, um, but, but I think, you know, we, we, it's the same problem, you know, we, I'm, so, I'm, I'm sick of seeing, you know, women dismembered on cop shows, you know, children. I mean, it's just the, the, those cliches repeat and repeat and repeat and they become a kind of d this terrible kind of dull loop. Um, and you, we have to kind of cut across that that crap, you know, uh, no matter who we are. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I'm always uncomfortable. It's really important to have these conversations about LGBTI, but I, but I also, I think the, the A on the end of that list of uh, letters is really important. I think, uh, I think we all have to be allies. Uh, and so I, I'm, I'm much more interested, I suppose, in, in intersectionality. Uh, than I am in d discussing these kind of issues. So the thing about these rich white men is that there are, there are only so many of them and there are more of us. Mm -hmm. And as long as we f keep squabbling amongst ourselves, we will never topple them. But if we, you know, if we can try and support one another and, uh, yeah, and avoid writing cliches about everybody, that's better. Also, when you see films that are um, touching upon this issue, they always put them like 40 years before, or 30 years before, or 20 years before. And it's a, I see a sort of a denial of the West that this problem still exists, because you still don't have any high-profile football player anywhere in Europe who's active, who's uh, openly gay. And that happens in well, lots of sports, in lots of uh, places. and. But when you talk to people, everybody says, no, here it's okay, we, we passed that bridge. And I see also that as a part of the problem, that this issue is not being tackled enough, even, even in those places. I don't know why it is actually that. Often people who have moved to cities from other places, who are very uh, kind of open to all lots of different people, uh, uh, very, very comfortable with LGBT, uh, very comfortable with uh, other nationalities. One of the reasons I'm thrilled to be here is I have a lot of Kosovan friends in London. That would not be the case for my sister who lives in a much smaller town 150 miles north where everybody voted Brexit because they want no more immigrants. They, they want men to be men, women to be women. They're just fucking sick of it. They're confused. They're like, what is it? For heaven's sake, we don't understand. And it's partly they just don't understand, you know. They kind of, they live in, they live in kind of entirely sort of white communities or they live in communities that are mostly white and then there is a, a kind of poor immigrant community down the road that they see as troublesome because it's it's a poor community that's the problem um, so they and they are yeah they live up a hill in a white community but they're terrified of refugees arriving by boat you know and it's just so there's a sort of paranoia and there's a disconnect certainly in the UK between a kind of I, I mean a liberal elite and I would I think yep. we're all part of that yep. but there is a disconnect and it's somebody described it as um, it's the uh, the somewheres and the anywheres so there are people who can live anywhere and there are people who just want to live somewhere they live to want to live in this place where they were born and they want things to continue to be pretty much the same um, and, and, and that's where some of that resistance lies. But I think the, I, there's no question that it is, there are places where it's very difficult still to be, to be out in, in the UK. Well, I think it's worth pointing out that in the three months after the Brexit vote uh, so tragically went the way yeah, yeah. that it went, uh, and uh, indeed economically suicidally, um, went the way that it went, the uh, hate crimes against people from LGBT groups went up by 147% in just three months, which is a, a great yeah. indication of exactly the problem of that mentality. Right. So it's um, so my, my daughter is 18. She's at school, a very mixed school in London. It's 80% non-white uh, school. It's a it's a kind of working class inner city school. She is a friend who has I think has always kind of presented as gay. I always thought he was gay, and I said to her about a year ago. So was has he come out? And she looked at me as though I was a dinosaur. You know, she said, Why would he come out? Why should he have to come out? Straight people don't come out. He's just who he is. Why would you even ask that question? And in some ways, I thought, bravo. And in some ways, I thought, oh, my God, you are such a North London princess, you know? Because it's not like that everywhere. And it's, but it's brilliant that that's how it is for her in that age group. You know, that that's, they just don't... And tra with transgender politics, they don't understand. They're like, what's the problem? Why do you have to worry about it? Everybody's gender queer now. Yeah. yeah. And they just... I think in answer to your question, I think those of us in the creative community know that we live in a utopia where you can be anyone you want to be. I personally think in outside West. of that, yeah, no, well, I think outside of that community, geography doesn't even come into it. Whether you're in the US or Britain or Europe or Russia, 
you know, in each of those places, just on the way over here, I was just got logged onto the BBC or Channel 4 News in a taxi, and it was a, a, someone in the Republican Party saying that transgender people shouldn't be allowed to serve in the US military. So that's, that's a conversation that's actually happening right now in 2017. So I think it doesn't even, geography doesn't even come into it. I think those of us in the creative community know that you can be anyone you want to be, but outside of that, of course, you know, opinions are going to be very but different. If you're, a, if you're, for example, an alien and don't yeah. understand the English language and watch the films, you yeah. think that the problem doesn't even exist in yeah. UK or and it just existed like 50 years ago or in the US. That's yeah. what I'm concerned about. Like if you watch all the films, they're all somewhere in the past, mm -hmm. especially the ones I saw, maybe I haven't seen them. I've got to yeah. tell you, half yeah. the population yeah. doesn't watch them. those films. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, they don't no, watch those So you're saying all of the stories, no, none of them are contemporary. Yeah. Yeah. So you're saying they're stories, not contemporary stories. stories, they always revert to the past, is what you're saying. All of yeah. the past, but basically you don't see this problem now in the you don't yeah, see prejudice. Course, you don't see that right. kind of. You don't see prejudice de depicted on screen. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like that gay bashing that caused the problem, yeah. for example. Yeah. And so people were so surprised they weren't used to see, seeing that uh, in film. So that shows a lot, actually, why they were surprised. Yeah. Mm -hmm. they, they, yeah. They're yeah. not used to seeing. They want to see all the progress and the good stuff. But then when you leave that out, then you're not talking about the problem. That's so very that, true. That says a lot. Yeah, I mean, I think we're in a very interesting time. I think 2017, if, if it's taught us anything, is, is to say we, we kind of pat ourselves on the back when things are going well, but the political events of the last 12 months, or, and I'm not just talking about the West, I mean all over the world, um, have kind of shown that we're, we haven't actually made that much progress. You know, the conversations that we're having aren't hugely different to the ones that we were having in the 60s and 70s, to, to, many, to many degrees. And there's certainly, but there are there are many many people we we now know, but I think a, a lot of, you know, a lot of us have known for a long time. There are people, the, the the freedoms that that many of us now enjoy. There are a lot of people who would be very keen to take those away. So you know, there are a lot of people who um, there is a reason why there are all those uh, cheap cop shows with women being dismembered. It's because there are a lot of people who really like to watch that stuff. It appeals to them at some profound level. Yeah, so that's how that's how they'd like their women is in a dumpster. Yeah, it's a, very, it's a very good point. When I, I went to see, when I, went, I know I keep coming back to Moonlight, I don't know why, but um, when I went to see it for the first time, I went to a Q&A with Barry Jenkins, and he was talking, if anyone's seen it, the film's broken up into three thirds, and in the final third, um, the two characters who've kind of been interacting in the first two sections come together at the end, and it's one guy making another guy dinner, and that's all it is. And Barry Jenkins said to the actor, um, right before they shot the scene, he was like, this is the first time this has ever been done in cinema. An African-American man making dinner for another African-American man. Yeah. And I was like, that's absolutely crazy. Yeah. That's the most simple, everyday thing. Like, I can say to you, has there ever been a man that's jumped out of an aeroplane and parachuted into a sports car and driven across a bridge and dived into the ocean? <laughs> and the answer is probably yes. yes. That's probably happened in some kind of Mission Impossible film. But an African-American making dinner for another African-American, the fact that that's never happened is absolutely bonkers. And it just means that every day, like the things that we do, the most simple everyday things that happen, which are really lovely, often aren't documented, and they easily could be. Yeah. Thank you guys, thank you a lot. I mean, I was, I'm very privileged to have you here and to have the chance to talk to you. We are probably going to talk a bit more and you will also meet with people during the festival. You're gonna be here for these very wonderful late days of the festival. Uh, we are gonna see your film, right? It Tomorrow at 10.30 uh, in the smaller room at the National Theatre. Please do come along. Yeah, free ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank it's you very much, evening. and thank <laughs> you for the festival that is giving us the opportunity. I'm sorry there are no a lot of LGBT people here in the community because I it would really be. I thought everyone here was LGBT. <laughs> well, they may be. Everybody we is. Don't yeah. know. But no, but there are a lot of other people who probably would love to come, but they missed it. But is their loss anyway? So thank you a lot. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. Thank you.